With this being my final day here, I wanted to give you guys something a little bit extra, a little bit different, because you know, one of the benefits of being here is you get access to talk to a lot of people, some of it off the record, some of it on the record. You know, a lot of y'all seem to appreciate us having Josh Shapiro on the show earlier this week to talk. And so today I wanted to include a conversation I had with Congressman Ro Khanna, because right? there's been a lot happening that I really wanted to get his opinion on. Right? There's been progressive infighting and love and hate towards AOC, the attacks and defenses of Donald Trump, as well as getting his take on, you know, the shift to the, the right wing that we've seen in Silicon Valley, and also to talk about the differences between alternative news like, like our show and mainstream news. And while I highly recommend you watch the whole thing, also for convenience sake, I'm gonna include time codes for each different question and take. Though I will say this interview, this conversation, it does start off by me telling him to address the allegations that he cut Philip DeFranco in the security line. Perfect. That I don't think we met in person. I'm not that track. No, just, I think just, just a Zoom. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so it's a, yeah, wait, I'll, I'll shake your hand. Pleasure to meet you. Pleasure. Although I have to say, the first question right out of the gate, on the way into the DNC, I'm standing in line because I'm a rule follower, and all of a sudden, from the left, a congressman. <laughs> what congressman was it Ro, what? Yeah, Ro Khanna comes in and just walks by. And I want to know, do you think that's becoming of a congressman? I uh, mean, what do I got to say? They, they've got a line where we could go with for through security. So. No, a few people vote for you, and all of a sudden you're like, I don't have to do lines but anymore. I, but I stand in line every time on Southwest at 8.30. Okay, so yeah, no, I'm the elitist, actually. I was like, I, I don't do Southwest, personally. Uh, wait, so I have a, I have a question, because on the, on the notion of labels, right, you've talked about, you called yourself a progressive capitalist, and I was really interested after last night what your take is, because there's like that classic criticism that... Uh, Progressives, they don't want power. They want the ability to criticize. And we have uh, Joe Biden, who's been described as one of the most progressive presidents out there. Uh, you had AOC last night just bringing down the House, but also it's very close to the, the DSA unendorsing her. So what's your, what's your take on that when you, when you hear that criticism? I think progressives have actually been very, very pragmatic with partnering with President Biden to get incredible progressive achievement. I mean, we have invested in new factories across this country after de deindustrialization and corporate greed sent so many jobs offshore. We have invested in rebuilding the infrastructure. We have invested in putting uh, the child tax credit money in pockets of many uh, Americans. We've invested $100 billion plus in schools and HBCUs. So President Biden, after his 2020 run, saw the strength of Bernie Sanders' campaign, saw the strength of Elizabeth Warren's campaign, and said, I want to co-opt a lot of those ideas. And last night you saw that. I mean, you saw AOC, Hillary Clinton, Joe Biden on the same stage. Who would have thought that? But what do you say as far as like where AOC kind of came from, right? What she was initially known for and when all of a sudden, you know, there's certain people that are making a, a bigger deal about it than, than others. Do you feel like there, there's, there's any legitimacy? Like when, when you see the, the AOC is unendorsed, what's your take on that? I think that that's unfortunate. I mean, look, I, I, everyone has the right to free speech and the right to, to make their own assessments, but AOC's policies have not really changed. I've known her, uh, her, her whole career. She's still for Medicare for all. She's still for free public college. She's still uh, advancing progressive ideas. The reality is that she's doing so in an effective way within the Congress and realizing how to wield uh, power. Uh, and that is a good thing. Now, if there are people who think that she's not pure enough or that she disagrees, then sure, criticize her. Run. I mean, we're in broad tent, and 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 that critique is is fine. But uh, I don't. I view her as a progressive. Was advancing policy. The fact that Tim Walz was picked. The fact that AOC, Jasmine Crockett spoke last night. Jamie Raskin spoke last night. The progressives have a big say in the mainstream of our party. We should celebrate that. And then on the opposite end, right, you're someone that will talk to anyone, right, which is a, a great quality. Uh, I know you pride yourself on going on to Fox News and, and you know, just I think you, you said that you as far as a House member, you are on Fox News the most. What I, I'm missing Jesse Waters tonight to do to do the show. I, yeah, Perfect. I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm, I'm Thanks, sorry, <laughs> but uh, like why what what would you say to criticisms that like. I, and this is, understand, this is not coming from me, because I, I think I know what you're going to say, but that they have you on, they have people to judge on, and that's a, a one in 20 experience, right? That they do that to legitimize the network that we're fair, and then 19 out of the other 20 times, it's repeating from talking points or pushing conservative policy points. What, what do you think about that? Like, when you hear that criticism? Well, more, first of all, more Democrats should go on, then maybe it'll become 
two out of 20 or three out of 20 instead of one out of 20. Second, they, those are folks who are hearing a point of view. And when I go on, I don't expect to convert them. I just want many of them to say, you know what? Ro County is a patriot. He's a decent guy, man. I like him. And it's not an electoral strategy. It's a strategy that at some point in this country, we need to learn how to talk to each other, to respect each other, to figure out some common purpose as a nation. I don't know when that'll happen, but if we're not even willing to listen and to respect the modes of uh, mediums where people get their information, what hope is there for the country? And I mean, on on the idea of shifting uh, opinions or I don't know if I would say shifting opinions. I'll just jump straight to the question. What is what is your take uh, when you look to Silicon Valley and you see uh, a lot of billionaires, especially in this cycle, moving to Donald Trump? Do why do you think we're seeing that? And because I, I feel like people will say, well, it's money. But do you think yeah. it's that simple or I don't think it's that simple. I mean, first of all, two thirds of the valley still support terrorists. Waltz, but Obama uh, had probably 80, 90 percent. In fact, I know Elon. Elon said he'd still support Obama if Obama was there. So why has this happened? A few reasons. One, I don't think our party has taken the right position on Bitcoin and the future of digital assets. We need to have a much more nuanced understanding of that issue. Second, we've got to be the party that says technology and building and entrepreneurship is good. Now, we have a vision of how to have the public-private partnership. It was Obama's administration that made Tesla possible, that made SpaceX possible. But we need to say that we celebrate building an entrepreneurship and want to partner with government to do it. The final point of view is that uh, there is a reflexive, free market, anti-state sentiment in some of the younger folks in Silicon Valley. And we've got to go back to the tradition of Steve Jobs and Tom Perkins and Andy Grove that recognized that the state had a lot of to do with building Silicon Valley. You tell us talk about that history. Do you feel like so? Do you feel like success has been demonized to some degree? No, I I I, I think that there's not enough understanding and appreciation for technology and entrepreneurship. The Democrats should be the party of building things, of making things, and we should critique the fact that agencies maybe are too slow. I wrote the Chips and Science Act. Why is it that the Commerce Department, a year and a half in, still has not given the money to the companies to build the factories? That's a real problem in a bureaucratic state that's not working as well in their trust. Why is it that we have restrictions that make it too expensive to build housing? Why is it that it takes so long to build things in America? Those are legitimate critiques that the Democrats should address and then offer a vision of how we still need the role of a state in reindustrialization in this country. So do you feel like the individual, as far as entrepreneurship, that rise, that can go in hand in hand with rising everybody? Because I think a lot of people, you know, there's the, the mindset of billionaires shouldn't exist. And when you talk about, especially younger folks, that's the kind of more and more of the mindset. Is there a world where those two things can actually work together on a grand scale and not just be an outlier situation? I do think so. I think you need the entrepreneurs to produce things, to generate wealth, but you need to tax it. And I run on a wealth tax. I'd say tax the billionaires. You know, you talk to a lot of the billionaires. I've asked them. I said, tell me how your life would change if you had to pay 2% on your wealth. Tell me, like, what would be different? Okay, now tell me how your kid's life would change. Now tell me how your grandkid's life would change. It wouldn't. So have the wealth generation, but tax it to provide health care, to provide child care, to provide free college, to make sure that so many Americans aren't living in debt. I mean, we've got people in this country, 20 and 30 year olds, that are crippled with student debt, that the debt keeps piling up. I had to take out $60,000 of loans and ended up being like $150,000 because of all the interest. They're piled up with medical debt. They're piled up with credit card debt. And an obscene amount of wealth is being produced in my district. $12 trillion of market value. We're more, producing more wealth than ever in human history in my zip code. So why can't we celebrate the production of it, tax it, and give more people a shot at the American dream? I love that. Uh, I like that ask... time you like something I said. I like everything. <laughs> it's been fantastic. Even though I opened up, I was like, what about this criticism? This criticism? <laughs> no, but uh, I, I've been asking everyone whenever I get a chance, what's your what's your take? It's every, every two years, every four years, we always see it. Uh, the, the fabled undecided voter, right? The the person that you always run into and they go, ah, two bad options, two equally bad options. What what, what would you say to people? Because 
I personally do not believe that we have a situation where it's two equally bad parties. Of course. But what what are two or three things that you'd say, well, that's obviously the difference and that should be the difference maker? What I'd say is, I, look, I understand why you may be upset. No longer can you have a single family income that can support the American dream and have a house, have a car, raise kids. Things have gone up in terms of prices. The jobs aren't as stable. The jobs aren't as good paid. But what is Donald Trump's solution to it? Because he actually had four years. Where were the new factories? Where were the new good paying jobs? What he did was cut taxes. And a lot of those tax cuts came to companies in my district. And you know what they did with it? They didn't put jobs in Johnstown. They didn't put jobs in Youngstown. What they did is they gave money to stock owners through dividends and they bought up back their stock. What our party believes is investing in new factories and new industry in these communities and raising the living wage and actually investing in the working class. And that's the difference. Uh, I understand why you're upset, but we've got better solutions. And by the way, you're right to be upset for the last 40 years of policies that have been wrong at shafting the working class. When people bring up the specific numbers, when they talk about Donald Trump, what would you say to, to respond to or to counter people that say, well, things were good, right? There, there it is. It was good, but COVID happened. It, that skewed everything. And so now everything's, sh uh, it's a shifted lens. Well, first, I would say that it's, the numbers actually don't show that with manufacturing. Under President Biden, there's been twice the manufacturing investment. There have been many times more of the new factories and new investment in left out places. The second thing is we had COVID and COVID was devastating and it was devastating precisely because of Donald Trump's leadership and Joe Biden had to dig us out of a huge ditch. We, he inherited unemployment at 8% and he brought it down. He inherited an inflationary environment because of COVID as a smart policy and with the Fed, he brought it down. So. You can't say that things were better before COVID. Obviously, there were a lot of things better before COVID, but it's Trump's leadership that exacerbated COVID. And one of the last things I want to ask is, I'm, I'm here on a creator credential, right? It's the first time the DNC is doing it. Um, and this is not me trying to get you to talk bad about the media. Everyone keeps kind of dancing around this question, so hopefully we can get an answer, because I feel like you're very upfront. As someone that's watch because I'm an alternative to the mainstream. Yeah. When you're doing these interviews o uh, over and over and you're, you see the news coverage, what's something that you feel like the mainstream news coverage covers too much or you wish that they would cover instead? Every question the mainstream media asks is about who's winning and how are they going to win. And most of the questions you asked me were about what do you believe in and how are you going to get things done? That's just not the conversation. I, every time I go on cable news, I have to remind myself, they're going to want to know who's up, who's down, how do you win? My job is to talk about what I want to do and what the party wants to do. And I think it is terrible, this, that, that, that coverage, the cycle of just being in a perpetual horse race, a perpetual of who's winning, who's up, who's down, wh who's insulted, who. And it's why people have tuned out of politics and have been so turned off about it. The content creators give us a chance to have fresh eyes, fresh dialogue, a new voice, a new vision in this country. And I'm excited about it. Look, you've moved probably from the outskirts of uh, the DNC now to this awesome view. Next time you'll be in, uh, in, 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 the, in the top suite. And one day you can aspire to going through the security line so you're not, you're not out there in, in, in hundreds of yards away. But that, that's, that's to be earned. I love it. So actually, last thing that I'll connect to that, do you, do you think it is a bug or the intention to make it a horse race? In terms of the media? Yeah. I, 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 look, I think that the media knew that we were losing before Kamala Harris came in. And now I genuinely think it is a horse race. But like every question shouldn't be, what are the polls? What, what does this mean for someone's chances? Uh, and there's an excessive focus on conflict. The media, I can't get on TV. Uh, if I insult someone right now, I'll be on, you know, the anchors will all want me on. If I say, here's how, here's the time I worked with J.D. Vance on some issue on manufacturing in Ohio, no one will want to hear that. And so you had a, a sensationalism in the press. And my point is that people are tired of that. And content creators want the conversations are longer. People are able to, to, to listen more podcasts. I could meet so many people. 
you know where I go? I go to the firehouses. The firefighters, they're there the whole day. And they listen to a lot of podcasts. And they consume a lot of alternative media because that's what they do a lot of the day. And you and they like that a lot more than the five-minute sound bites of cable news. Robert Kennedy rose initially in the polls because he was out there doing podcasts and independent media. Congressman, thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate, appreciate your time. It. Thank you.